Hi, welcome everybody to the very first edition of our 2024 Lenten text study series. Our theme throughout the season of Lent here at St. Mark Presbyterian Church is uh, between our rock and hard places. So week after week, we're going to read some Old Testament texts that talk about God's steadfast love and God's covenant with us. That's our rock. And each week we're going to look at some New Testament texts that look at challenges that Jesus or the disciples or we ourselves might face along the way. And those are our hard challenges. So in our worship services throughout the season of Lent, we're going to bounce between this rock that secures us and those hard challenges that we face. For our Lenten study, primarily we're going to pay attention to the gospel lessons each week, and I'll show you what they are in just a moment. So every Monday, I'm going to uh, upload this 30-minute video. You're watching the first one now, and if you have asked for it, or if you're on my mailing list for text studies, you will receive a link to the video, a link to our Wednesday Zoom discussion which is in person in the Bonhoeffer Room at St. Mark at 9.30 on Wednesday mornings. But if you can't be there, it will be captured on Zoom. Uh, you can either watch it live on Zoom or you can go back and watch the recording later. Um, and uh, all of that plus a handout for our discussion will be sent to you if you're on my mailing list. If you're not, then I'll show you later uh, in a moment how you can get on there. These are the texts at which we'll be looking in the season of Lent. You might remember that six years ago, we went through these texts with almost all the same dates. The last three dates changed because this year is leap year and six years ago was not. Um, but we're gonna go back and revisit these from six years ago. And um, you'll see that we start out in the Gospel of Mark, spend a little time in the Gospel of John, and then back to Mark for the Palm and Passion reading. That's a long, long reading on the sixth Sunday uh, and Saturday of Lent, which is also Palm and Passion weekend. So if you have any questions, you can contact us at this address. Do a screen capture of your um, video right now, and you can have this at your disposal. You can call us. Uh, if you're not receiving the emails, but somehow you're still watching this, you'd like to receive the emails, just drop us a line, okay? So uh, today, we're going to spend more time than ever on the process that we have in our text study, okay? So we're, we're, we're going to wait and look at the text in a moment, but prior to that, we're going to look at the process that we follow in our text study. Because really there are two dynamics in play. And the first is how we read texts. And the second is how texts are written. And those are two very, very different things. Um, and we want to bring them into synchronicity as much as possible. Um, but, but let me explain what I mean by that, okay? Uh, the, the, the process of learning that has really meant uh, a lot to me, particularly when it comes to studying the Bible or theology, uh, but also in many other avenues of life, uh, was first articulated for me uh, by Paul Ricoeur. He was a French uh, literary critic, argued that our learning process goes through basically three stages. I'm going to simplify it, I'm going to wrap it up in ways that mean a lot to me personally. And in doing so, we're going to look at the Old Testament reading for this coming weekend's worship services, which is the story of Noah and the ark. We're not going to look at the whole thing, of course, but I want to use that as kind of our touch point to walk through Recur's three-step stages of learning uh, to, to try to simplify and, and explain what, what he means by that, okay? Ricoeur argues that when we read texts, particularly when we read the Bible, we initially read the text with what he calls the first naivete. You, you just read the story, there it is, it's, it's read as written. Uh, you don't necessarily give it a whole lot of critical thought. 
You don't ask questions of the text necessarily. You just kind of hear it. Um, it might be a story that's a narration. It might be a parable. It might be a, a, a teaching text. It might be a bit of history, but whatever. <clears throat> you just read the text as a text, and you read it with, with the disposition that uh, Recur calls the first naivete. Um, it's not a criticism. We all begin that way. It is often associated with how we encounter biblical stories as children. It's not just associated with that. A colleague of mine years ago had read a study that said most people's approach to the scriptures haven't changed since they were eight years old. So at eight years old, they, had, they just learned a certain way of reading the Bible, and they just hung on to that. It just, it's what the Bible means to them. And at eight, year, eight years old, it typically means that we're reading the Bible with what's called the first naivete. We, um, we read a story, we don't ask difficult questions about it, we don't look for internal interrogations or anything like that. Uh, we just read the story and take it at face value. Um, an example would be the story of Noah and the ark, right? Many of us encountered this story as children. And when we did, it was just a very um, uh, lovely story. We, we, we have um, in our house a little quilt that someone made one of our children when they were born that has Noah's Ark and all the happy animals and so forth. And it, it's a story that captures our imagination, you know, what's it like to be on this boat for 40 days, 40 nights with all these animals, the monkeys, the monkeys, you know, they were fun. Um, how, to, how to deal with the elephant, how to... Uh, keep the lions separated from their natural prey. You know, things like that. And, and we encounter the story, and it's a flood, and it's a happy boat, and everybody on the boat is saved from the flood, and after the flood, you know, they get to rebuild life. And it, it, that's the first naivete. Just read the story the way it's given to us. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of times, that's, good enough for us. We stay there. We hear a parable by Jesus. We just stay in the, in the topical reading of it, that first naivete. Um, and one can be in this stage of reading and be happy. It's fine. Um, but I think it's not as rich as it could be. And I, and I think sometimes we, we call it simple faith and I, I, I'm not sure if we always should call it that. Um, because sometimes life comes at you sideways. And when it does, it forces us to see things that perhaps we didn't notice before. And we enter what Recur calls this critical stage of reading. A critical stage. So like with the Noah story, um, you know, you look at it, it when you're eight, and it's just this great little story of all the happy animals being saved. And around 13, <laughs> you look at it and say, well, but the other animals die. The bunnies, the bunnies, they die. Sweet little bunnies, right? Um, and you start to look at the sheer destruction in that story. I mean, you've got eight humans and two of every kind of animal, uh, happy in the ark, perhaps, um, but everything else dies and everyone else dies. This is a tragic story of enormous proportions. And, um, and, and that does things to you, right? It, it makes you start questioning the story. It makes you start questioning God who sent the flood. It makes you question whether the story is literally true or, or, or meant to be, you know, a parable of some sort. It makes you study, um, you know, where the story came from. There are a lot of things that plunge us into this critical moment. Sometimes we enter it deliberately, and when we do, we, you know, we can process our way through, um, and, and maybe that's safe, or maybe that's helpful. Um, but sometimes we're just plunged into this critical reading uh, because, you know, we, we, we read the story and we realize everybody's died, except for these eight people. Or, sometimes the text itself 
doesn't let us treat it as a simple story. If you read the story of Noah carefully, you'll see that some parts of that story use the language from the first creation story in Genesis chapter 1, and some parts of that story describe things using the language of the second creation story in Genesis chapter 2. Um, once you know that they're the first and a second creation story and they don't tell the story the same way, now you're looking at a story that seems to be weaving together what might originally have been two different stories. Also, you may run across uh, the um, um, interreligious dialogue that said, you know, a lot of ancient cultures had a flood narrative in their history and in their story that became part of their religious understanding. It wasn't just the people of Israel who had a story like this. So now you, you've got a different kind of complexity there. How are those stories alike? How are they different? If, if, if those religions didn't have Noah and the family, who did survive? How did that happen? Why should I say those stories are nonsense while this one's true? Right? You, you start, there are questions that come up internally to the text, comparatively, among different types of text, uh, whether we're talking inside the Bible or outside of it. And, uh, and they're real questions. They're real questions. They're questions that people who want to know the truth, people who want to honor and serve God, these are the questions they ask. So this is a time of critical thinking where that first naivete is kind of broken open and we can't read the story like that anymore. Uh, whether it's the destruction or the comparative literature or the internal dynamics of the story, something's not letting us read it like we did when we were eight years old. And this is the critical phase. And in this critical stage of reading, uh, I, I, I would encourage us to have courage and go for it. This is what we do mostly in our text studies. This is not a Bible study where everybody just kind of reads the story and tells us what you think about it. it we, we are looking deliberately, critically at the story, and it can be done faithfully. I want you to know that. But it can also be a phase where you just kind of get stuck. Uh, the stories all become too complex to mean anything, and uh, you can become jaded about the text if you look closely at the internal dynamic comparative text and so forth. Um, but this is the critical phase. And then Paul Ricoeur argued that on the other side of critical thinking, there is what he called the second naivete, where you look at the story and you begin to see it as a story not like you did originally, that maybe, you know, it's literally true or it had to be just like this or look at the happy boat. Um, but you see it as a story, yes, of destruction. Yes, uh, that, that's similar to other stories in other traditions. All the stuff we went through in the complexity stage are still there. But now on the other side of complexity, we look at the story and we say something like, you know, imagine you're living in Israel and the northern Assyrian army has invaded and has taken away a number of people in exile and just doing sheer destruction of those who are left behind. Okay, just, just imagine you're in that moment. Let's say you're one of the exiles. <laughs> and let's say you're holding out hope that after this period of destruction, which is horrible and you hate it, you don't like it, this is the world, folks. It's, it can be very, very conflictual and destructive. But you're hoping that at some point the exiles will return and be able to begin anew. How do you say that story? How do you, how do you fix that story in, your, in a way that, that can be meaningful and hopeful for people? And, and Noah's story might well be something like that. Uh, the theological question behind the exile was, did we bring this on? Did, is this God's punishment for us? And um, the Noah story would argue, yeah, yeah, it was. But in the end, God will save and renew life. But in the beginning, this is a punishment story because of, because of injustice and violence. You, 
the, the, the people have erred, and this is the result of doing that in God's world. That would be a, a different way of looking at the story, saying, yeah, this story has a point, or, or even several points, um, that are meaningful and applicable and helpful and, and, and teaching moments for us. Um, but we don't have to ignore the complexity to get there. This is the second naivete. This is looking at the story as a fresh, meaningful story on the other side of all of that complexity. Now, that's, this is the process we follow in our text studies, uh, particularly in our discussions on Wednesdays. Most often, sometimes it's a little different, most often, the handout begins with what I call the first reading, and it ends with what I call the second reading. And in the middle of the first and the second reading, there's a whole bunch of detail. We walk through the text, we ask questions, we look at uh, translation issues and, and do word studies and all. That's the complexity. So we start with the first naivete. We read the story, say, what is the story about? First impression. It's okay. That's where we all start. And then we start looking at the details inside. It gets kind of hairy at times. And then we circle back after looking at the details for a second reading. Now, what do we hear the story saying? And, and in many ways, I have been personally influenced by uh, Recur's process. And, and that's what we follow in our discussions as a result. What we're going to do this year is a little step beyond that because what I want to suggest, uh, this is not my idea, this comes from Walter Brueggemann who is a, a just very well beloved Old Testament professor, retired from Columbia Seminary and a profound, profound interpreter of scripture. And um, Walter Brueggemann argues that the text itself has a three-step process very similar to what we just talked about in terms of our way of reading text. His argument is that um, there's a dynamic where the text begins with orientation. It, it, it sets us in a place and it gives us context. It, it uh, begins a story. But al almost right after that, texts often slip into disorientation. Something goes wrong. There's a challenge. There's a, there's a thing that we didn't expect. And uh, the story becomes much more complicated than it seemed at first. This is all very familiar language, right? Um, and following that, now you have a reorientation where the orientation from the beginning has gone through that disorientation and now become something new. And just for the last few minutes, let me just walk through our, our reading this week from Mark's Gospel, and we'll break it up and talk about how it fits this pattern that Walter Brueggemann has talked about. I say it fits the pattern, really. The, fa the pattern can be a helpful way of reading this story. Okay? So let me show you what I mean. That this is the orientation portion of our reading. We start with verse 9, and we'll go through verse 11. Okay? Um, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Okay, so this is the introduction to Jesus in Mark's Gospel. There was one previous mention of Jesus. It's in what some people call verse 1. I think it actually was a title. <laughs> the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Um, and uh, <clears throat> but after that initial phrase, it's not even a complete sentence. I, I think it's a title, but after that, 
the first eight verses of Mark's gospel are not about Jesus. They're about John the baptizer. And they describe what John looks like, what John does, what John's up to, and all those things. So those first eight verses are about John the baptizer. And here in verse 9, now we have Jesus. This is the introduction of Jesus into the story itself. Um, so here's Jesus. What do we know? He's from Nazareth in Galilee. He's baptized by John, like a whole lot of other people. If you read those first seven verses, uh, John's preaching was powerful. John's effect was uh, large. And many people came to be baptized. And then... Um, but then we see this is not like every baptism, is it? There's something about this Jesus that's very, very different. And so as he's coming up out of the water, and that could either signify, you know, he's been immersed and now being pulled up out of the water, or it can be that he went and stood in the water and John put some water on him, and now he's walking up out of the water. But as Jesus comes out of the water, look what happens. Jesus sees the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. We'll talk on Wednesday about what that could mean. Um, and a voice comes from the heavens, and unlike some of the other tellings, this is a personal, direct, second-person address that says, You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Here's Jesus, right? He's coming up from Nazareth, which all the traditions locate Jesus in Nazareth at the beginning, right? He comes from Nazareth, of Galilee, goes to the Jordan, baptized by John. The heavens open. The Spirit descends. The voice says to him, You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. So this is a baptism like many, but this is a, a, a baptism unlike many as well right and this is our introduction to jesus so that's our orientation when the gospel begins with the phrase the good news of jesus christ son of god even if that's the first verse or the subtitle or the title of it of it this is our introduction this is what it's about the beloved son of god no question starting into this gospel that jesus at least is self-aware that he is the beloved son of God. That's going to be tried and tested over time uh, in many, many ways. But this is the orientation. Jesus, the beloved son of God. Then we get to the disorientation part. The part that we call the, uh, the story of the uh, temptation, right? And I think this is verses 12 and 13. Um, and it reads like this. The spirit that spirit that came down like a dove out of the torn open heavens. The spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with wild beasts and angels waited on him. So now, you know, this is what it means to be the beloved son of God. <laughs> he just got baptized. And in that baptism, he hears his voice from heaven, and it declares him the beloved son of God, right? Um, and, and immediately, this is an associated thing, right? Uh, that spirit that came descending like a dove throws him, literally throws him, into the wilderness where he was tempted for 40 days by Satan. So, so just, just look at what goes on here. We're not in Nazareth anymore. We're not at the Jordan anymore. Suddenly, we're in the wilderness. And he's tempted by Satan. He's living among hyenas and other wild beasts. So he's in danger. And he has angels waiting on him. The verb there is the verb from which we get the word deacon. Deacon. There's, he's got deacon angel waiting on him. Um, this is what happened to the beloved Son of God. And, and, and you think someone might want to say, you know what, I'll just be a normal baptizee. I'll get baptized and I'll come out of the water and, you know, repent and start living life a new way. But, you know, this is difficult. 
So that orientation of Jesus as a beloved son, which sounds lovely, now is thrown into disorientation that the beloved son is driven by the spirit. It's not that the devil just came and took wax at Jesus. The spirit puts him out there for this time and angels are there to offer him nurture and help. So this is the disorientation. And then the text moves to like a reorientation. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. So John's arrested. This is a dangerous world into which Jesus is stepping. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God which is just what John had been saying. And um, now we can ask, you know, what does it mean that Jesus is proclaiming that the reign of God uh, is near, the time is fulfilled? This is coming from Jesus, who not only has been baptized and declared the uh, beloved Son of God, but also who now has spent 40 days in the wilderness being tempted by Satan living among wild beasts and, and, and nurtured by angels. So this is, a, this is an incredible thing. I mean, what would it be like if you didn't have an introduction to John's ministry in those first seven verses and Jesus just showed up preaching this? It would be great. It would be great. Um, but, it, but it wouldn't quite have the same effect. What if Jesus got baptized, declared God's beloved, and then started preaching this. That would be great. It would be fine. Um, but that's not how Mark tells the story. Jesus is baptized. He is declared the beloved Son of God. But then he's thrown into the wilderness for 40 days of temptation by the devil, living among beasts, nurtured by angels. Then he preaches this. So now when we hear this, it sounds differently than it would have without that complexity in the middle, without that time of disorientation. So that's what we're going to spend our time looking at on, uh, on Wednesday, is just uh, the orientation, disorientation, reorientation flow of this text. I, I think the important thing is Brueggemann argues that this flow, this, this pattern, one can detect in the text itself. It's not just, as Recur was uh, informing us, the way that we read text. Yes, we go from simplicity to complexity to the, the second naivete, as it were. Um, but the text itself is written in that kind of way. And you can read it deliberately from the text that way. So that's what we'll look at on Wednesday. Thanks again. If you have any questions, email us here or call us here. And I look forward to seeing as many of you as I can. Thanks. Bye.